Now, I would like to start with an intro, a preface as to how I came upon this case and the idea to begin a podcast with the killing of Kyle and Kevin to be my premiere episode. I'll be the first to admit that although there were many twists and turns and weirdness filling my childhood, mine was actually pretty interesting and very cool. In fact, I'd go back in a heartbeat. Heidi was my childhood best friend. We grew up in what was once a small town called Syracuse in the northern part of Utah. We lived on a relatively busy street, just two houses away from each other. Though our lives became significantly different in adulthood, we've never lost touch. I earned a degree in criminal justice, then moved to Los Angeles to work as a producer in the film industry. Heidi went into accounting and established an ideal life and home with a beautiful family. I initially learned of Kyle's passing via social media, as is normal nowadays. It was December 9th, 2016. I immediately grabbed my phone and shot a text to Heidi to offer my condolences. Kyle is the son of Heidi's older sister. I still remember when Kyle was born. Not that I was there. Just that Renee had given birth and had named her child Kyle, spelled C-Y-L-E. I knew Kyle's father as well. He attended school with my older brother, and they both shared a love of hockey. I would often see him at hockey games. The date was July 3rd, 2019. I was in Los Angeles, and it just so happened Heidi was driving to the Los Angeles area. Her husband and kids in tow to celebrate the 4th of July holiday and have a summer beach vacation with her four children. After we had caught up on the neighborhood chatter, we moved to another topic. What we were working on now and what was next in our lives. At the time, I was wrapping up a film franchise and had a couple other film projects in various stages. But otherwise, I wasn't really sure. She said, you know what you should do? You love crime. You're a great storyteller. You should podcast my nephew's murder and get it solved. I know. I took in an audible deep breath and exhaled. (gasps) What? It's cold? She said, pretty much. Hello, Siders. Welcome to Dark Sides, a true crime podcast where dark sides think alike. I am your host, the queen of crime, Lara Young. This is season one, episode one, the killing of Kyle and Kevin. A slight dusting of snow fell on a frigid December day in 2016. A snowfall perfect to grab a shoe print and freeze it, making it capable of contributing to part of a tragic story, evidence in a horrific crime, one that would change lives forever and go unsolved for years. Like most tragic days, December 9th, 2016 started out typical. It was a Friday and people were excited for the weekend and upcoming holiday parties. 24-year-old Kyle Van Komen and his roommates had worked all day They worked as painters. Before heading home, their boss, Randy, who is also Kyle's uncle, drove them to their landlord so they could pay their rent. Paying rent left them with little money to recreate or be a target of a robbery for that matter. As day turned to night in South Ogden, Utah, friends began arriving at the bachelor pad at 3636 Ogden Avenue. Kyle had only lived in the three-story house with a blue facade for approximately four months. But the house was known as a hangout, a party house. Kyle had always been a loving person, social and accepting of all people. He was adventurous and a lot of fun to be around. Friends, family, neighbors, and strangers gravitated to him. He enjoyed going fishing. He loved playing hockey and was very good at it. This gave him a team mentality where he was often protective, yet welcoming and inviting, like a mentor to those around him. Kyle had such a bright, warm, and comforting smile, which he shared frequently. His famous smile earned him the hashtag, smile like Kyle. Above all, Kyle absolutely loved his family. 
They were his VIPs, and he especially shared a strong bond with his mother, Renee. To put Ogden into perspective, South Ogden, Utah sits at the base of the towering snow-covered Wasatch Mountain Range, 34 miles north of Salt Lake City, Utah. Ogden's 25th Street was the largest stop west of the Mississippi during the gold rush. The heart of South Ogden is home to the Weber State University Wildcats. In fact, approximately one mile from Kyle's home was student housing and the university campus. Kyle and his 20-year-old brother, Brock, as well as his stepbrother, Taylor, had plans to go visit their mom later that evening. Before they headed out, they waited for another young man in his early 20s to arrive and had discussed possibly going bowling. Friends came and went from the home Kyle shared with his roommates. He was very close to his brother, Brock, who, unlike Kyle, is quiet and a bit shy. The guys grew hungry and made a last-minute decision to go to the grocery store for Hot Pockets. Just then, the neighbor, 61-year-old Kevin Nelson, who lived next door, stopped in to hang out following a holiday party just a few houses away. Kyle told his brothers to go to the grocery store without him as he was going to stay and chat with Kevin. They would bring a Hot Pocket back for him. In the dark shadows of the cold night, three masked subjects waited, maliciously watching their every move. The neighbor, Kevin's home security cameras, filmed the gunman stalking the house and its occupants, their comings and goings. They stopped for an hour and 25 minutes in the freezing cold. They watched when Kevin arrived and they saw when Brock and his stepbrother left. It's unclear how they decided the right moment to make their move. What were they waiting for up to this point? Two other friends, young men in their early 20s, were also in the house at the time. Unbeknownst to them, they would soon become known as the survivor and the witness. The two of them went out the back door of the house, believing they had heard something. The plan was to see what the commotion was about and smoke a cigarette. Words were exchanged, and when the soon-to-be survivor asked the stalkers outside, what are you guys doing? The perpetrators then made their deadly move. Was it because they were caught in their suspicious activities? Two of the three men held the survivor and the witness at gunpoint on the small back patio area. When asked, what do you want? One of the men replied, we're here for drugs and money. To which the survivor responded, we don't have any. Meanwhile, a single gunman entered the home. No one knows what ensued inside the house, but within approximately three minutes, the witness and survivor outside the house heard gunshots. Immediately, the lone gunman emerged out of the back door. The survivor started to tell him that the shootings weren't necessary. That's when he was abruptly shot in the neck, rendered unconscious. He rolled behind a nearby shed. The witness bolted down the street, approximately five houses away, and frantically knocked on a neighbor's door. In a panic, he told the neighbor to call 911. He believed three of his friends had been shot. It was then that the brothers returned from the store, arriving home to an unimaginable horror. As they attempted to open the front door, they could feel an obstruction blocking their attempts. They peered through the window and noticed the couch had been pushed against the door. Neighbor Kevin sat lifeless upon the couch, blood running down the center of his face. Brock forced his way into the house and found his best friend, his brother, his life companion since birth, unresponsive on the floor. Not knowing whether the shooter or shooters might still be in the house, but believing Kyle to be unconscious, Brock knelt down next to him, turned him over, and began performing CPR, causing blood to transfer to Brock's clothes and hands. At this point, the police arrived in response to the witness's 911 call. They entered with guns drawn and commanded Brock and Taylor to put their hands up. Kyle's brothers instantly became the first persons of interest in the homicides. Once they were cleared at the scene, the first call Brock made was to his father, 
at which point he broke the life-altering tragic news that Kyle was dead. By the looks of the disheveled furniture, it was apparent there was a struggle between the victims and their killer. As arriving emergency personnel and police continued to respond to the scene of the crime, what was now already a double homicide, they soon located their attempted murder victim, who had rolled behind the backyard shed. He was rushed to the hospital and luckily survived the ordeal. Police began to canvas the area and process the scene. They were able to collect video surveillance evidence of the stalking that took place ahead of the killing. There were photographs of shoe prints collected, hours of interviews, and even DNA. As detectives worked on putting together the pieces of a puzzle two days after the murder, Kyle's mom, Renee, who should have been celebrating her birthday with her kids, was instead planning a funeral for her oldest son. The worst part about this double homicide, besides the loss of life, is the fact that seven years later, the crime continues to go unsolved. Three criminals remain at large, free to kill again. Many questions and theories remain. Was the target Kyle or Kevin? What was the motive? It's believed the motive is what the perpetrator stated to the witness, a robbery gone wrong, but nothing was stolen. Is this a case of mistaken identity? After an hour and 25 minutes of stalking the victims, it seems unlikely that it was a mistake. But why an hour and 25 minutes of standing in the freezing cold if the gunmen were certain of their targets? Many of the interviews conducted claim that Kyle might have been dealing drugs, which put his life in danger. However, there were no illegal substances found in Kyle's system during toxicology tests. At the time, Kyle did not have an accessible vehicle and he did not have a working cell phone, both items which drug dealers and gang members need for their business dealings. Kyle also had no criminal record and was not known to police. Days after the killings, the families learned that many drug dealers did live on Ogden Avenue. Could the intruders have gotten the wrong house? Because Kyle had only lived at the house for four months and Kevin didn't live there at all, could this have been a hit meant for the previous occupants? Five days after the murders, a search warrant was served on a house situated along the same street of the killings. The warrant listed evidence the police believed to be in the home, as well as linked to the crime. Items listed included any and all home security surveillance DVR systems, computers, laptop computers, cell phones, hard drives, digital media storage, Tula Amo, Winchester Luger ammunition, any 9mm firearms, clothing, backpacks, Nike Air Jordan shoes, masks, plastic Halloween masks, paintball masks, paper notebooks, and any other items related to the homicide at 3636 Ogden Avenue, South Ogden. An inventory of items seized during the search of the suspected home are listed as follows. White plastic mask with small elastic strap. Skull mask, a notepad with Kyle Van Komen's name written in ink. Miscellaneous nine millimeter and 22 ammunition. Box of Tula ammo with 33 bullets and a Bunker Hill digital recorder system. It is not believed that Kyle or his roommates had any connection to or even knew the neighbors in the suspected house. The occupants of the home where the search warrant was served were cleared of suspicion in the double homicide or there was not enough evidence gathered to continue pursuing the lead. Another possibility for the murders stems from Kyle's love and protection of his family. He was very close to his uncle, Randy. They frequently worked together, and Randy spent time with Kyle and his friends at the home where the murder took place. Uncle Randy had similar physical attributes to Kevin Nelson. This fact, sadly, led Randy to believe that he may actually have been the target of this hit. It stands to reason that an hour and 25 minutes of stalking in the frigid December air could indicate the killers were waiting for someone to arrive, 
Were they waiting for Randy to arrive and assumed Kevin was their target? With the theory that the suspects might have been waiting for the arrival of someone or something, one more friend comes up. The 20-something friend that was scheduled to arrive and possibly go bowling that night. He was running late. Was he running an hour and 25 minutes late? Who knew he was coming and did anyone have a reason to rob and or kill him? Did he tell someone to meet him at the house on 3636 Ogden Avenue? Did the suspects believe Kevin Nelson might be that friend? Here's what we know. Beginning at 6.32 p.m., the security footage shows the first image of a masked suspect with a crossbody bag slung over his shoulder. At 6.34 p.m., the second masked person appears. Three minutes later, at 6.37 p.m., the third masked individual arrives on camera. For 40 minutes, they quietly stalk their prey, moving in and out of frame from three different cameras. They are seen leaving their shoe prints in the snow. One of them lifts their mask to smoke a cigarette and eventually flicks the cigarette butt into the snow. At some point, one of the suspects points a handgun in the direction of the house. Although it is uncertain, it appears that the suspects are two men and a woman. But you can go to my website and see the full videos of what the police have released and decide for yourself at www.darksides.com That's www.dark, D-A-R-K, sides, C-I-D-E-S, dot com. At 7.28 p.m., Kevin enters the house. Then, 21 minutes later, at 7.49 p.m., Brock and Taylor are seen leaving the house headed to buy Hot Pockets from the nearby grocery store. Somewhere between 7.51 p.m. and 7.55 p.m. and what is not caught on camera is the three suspects making their fatal move. At 7.55 p.m., the witness, who ran for his life to get help, is seen on camera moving in a westerly direction. The neighbor's 911 call was made at 7.58 p.m. At 8.02 p.m., Brock and Taylor are seen arriving back at the house after being gone just 13 minutes to make the most horrific discovery of their lives. We know there were five men in the house prior to the killings. When Kevin arrived, that made six. Then the two brothers left for Hot Pockets, leaving four men in the house. Two of them went out the back door and were held at gunpoint by two of the suspects. The gunman entered the home, leaving within three minutes and having shot and killed both Kevin Nelson and Kyle Van Komen. Nine millimeter shell casings were located near the bodies. From the disheveled appearance of the home, it is clear that a struggle ensued. After the killer exited the house, he shot one of the men on the back porch and the other man bolted, running to call 911. Unknown DNA was collected from the scene, possibly taken from under Kyle's fingernails or from the cigarette butt in the snow. Everything needed to solve a homicide. Surveillance footage, a survivor, a witness, DNA, and shell casings for comparison. The only thing missing is the murder weapon and of course our suspects. Here's where I have to interject and interrupt my own podcast to present a theory. If you were going to rob a house full of adult men, wouldn't you go in the middle of the night once they're all asleep? I would argue most smart criminals are going to enter the house in the middle of the night as all occupants are sleeping and not on guard. But in this case, it was just before 8 p.m. local time. That leads me to the conclusion that they were definitely waiting for someone or something to arrive. A few more questions. Was the DNA test completed and no matches were found? Leading any logical person to think there is no way this is a first offense for these killers. Surely their DNA has got to be in the CODIS, 
combined DNA index system database? Or is the evidence in this case like so many thousands of DNA samples that have gone unprocessed? If there was not a match to the DNA, can familial DNA be completed on the sample? Although this violent crime that has devastated Kyle and Kevin's family and friends remains unsolved, there are at least three people who know who the murderer is. Someone knows something. I would like to raise reward money using the platform GoFundMe for anyone that has information leading to an arrest and conviction of the perpetrators of the murder of Kyle Van Komen and Kevin Nelson. Let's fight to give these families and locals of South Ogden some peace in this matter. Please visit my website, www.darksides.com. That's www.darksides.com to watch surveillance footage associated with this case. This is also where you will find the GoFundMe to raise reward money for information leading to a resolution in the case of Kyle Van Komen and Kevin Nelson. Don't forget to subscribe at darksides.com for more information on this case and future podcast cases. Lastly, if you have information regarding this case, please call the Cold Case Tip Hotline at 1-833-DPS-SAFE. That number again is one 833 377-7233 or I encourage you to email me at podcast at darksides.com Until we meet again where dark sides think alike I am your host Laura Young and you've been listening to Dark Sides The Killing of Kyle and Kevin <laughs> <laughs>